So we will be diving into Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 through 24. If you guys have your Bibles, please open it up. If you guys have a Bible app, please open that up and follow along as I read. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, verses 11 through 24. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 24, it says this. Please follow along. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from anyone, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extreme and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately to Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Verse 18, Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Later, I went to Syria and to Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches in Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for today. God, we see your grace, Lord, upon our lives. And we praise you because you are our good and gracious Father. And Lord, as we dive into your word, Lord, I do pray uh, that you will open up, Lord, the eyes, the ears, and the hearts of your people, Lord to receive your message. And Father God, be with me. May your spirit lead me as I preach your word. May you help me, Lord, to faithfully communicate your word to your people. We lift this up to you, pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, so last week, if you guys uh, were here or if you guys remember. Paul got right to the point of this letter. Okay, Paul got right to the point of this letter to the Galatians. That he was shocked, he was surprised, he was stunned that the Galatians were so quick to abandon the gospel that he preached to them. And he informed them that, hey, another gospel, that when we add to the gospel of grace, it is not the gospel. It is a different gospel, a gospel that cannot save you, a gospel that cannot save you. And so when you do that, you change your allegiance from the one who has called you into his family. So when you leave the gospel of grace, you are no longer part of God's family. You are no longer part of God's family. And that's why Paul was stunned by their actions that they will leave the truth, the truth of the gospel. And like I said to you guys last week, if I was in Paul's shoes, I would be stunned too. I would be stunned too. That if I was here and I taught you guys for 10, 15, 20 years And as soon as I leave, I hear that now you guys have moved away from the truth of God's word and now have started to believe in doctrines that are unbiblical. I would be shocked. 
And so that's Paul. He's expressing that he is stunned by the actions of the Galatians, that they would be so uh, responsive or give such a great response to these false teachers. And so you see again, when the Galatians turn to a gospel of works, right? When they turn to the gospel of works, where they're, they're adding in the Mosaic law in there, it is no longer a gospel that can save. Jesus plus works equals a gospel that cannot save. Is Jesus plus nothing equals a gospel that saves. So when we add in works to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you no longer have the gospel that saves you. And it is important for us to know that. Not, okay, let me get this out. Not that works, not that we should not do works. Yes, it is important that we serve, okay? But we don't serve to gain salvation. That is what Paul is arguing. And that is what Paul is saying to the Galatians. And so as we dive into our section here in Galatians 1, verses 11 through 24, we see that Paul once again is defending his call, and the message that he preached. And so two things here I want us to see. One is that God calls people to salvation. God calls people to salvation. And two, those who are called, lives will be transformed. Okay? Lives will be transformed. So first, God calls people to salvation. We continue to see Paul's line of argument here for the gospel that he received and that he preached to the Gentiles. So to help the, the, the Galatians see that the gospel he preached was true, what does Paul do here? Paul shares to them. He reminds them of his former life. Who was Paul? Right? Who was Paul? If we read Acts, we see that Paul was one who persecuted the church. Paul persecuted the church in his former life. Prior to coming to Christ, he persecuted the church. But if we look at Paul's life, then we can see God's grace all over his life. But again, let's take a quick look at who was Paul. Paul was born as Saul into a family that held strictly to the Mosaic law, strictly to the traditions. Yet he was one who was very educated. Okay? Paul was very educated. We see, Paul says here in verse 14, right? I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age. So you can say he was like, he was like the top of the class. He was very, very smart. His knowledge of the Mosaic law, his knowledge of the traditions led him to come to become very zealous, very passionate in upholding the Mosaic law, in upholding the traditions that he was taught, which again then ultimately led him to persecute the early church. And so we, if, if we look into Acts and we see that as the gospel is advancing, as the gospel is being preached and it is advancing and people are believing in Jesus Christ, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the leaders did everything that they could to stop the spread, right? They imprisoned believers. And so Paul being part of this sect, zealous for the Mosaic law, wanted also to stop the spread of the gospel. Because again, he believed in his heart that in order to be right with God, you must follow the Mosaic law. You must follow the Mosaic law. And so when we look at Acts 7, 
The stoning of Stephen. Luke introduces us to this young man, Saul, who was watching and giving approval to the stoning, to, to the stoning of Stephen. So we see that Paul was there, right there, giving his approval. Yes, stone this person. Stone this person to death. He witnessed the death of Stephen. In Acts 8, the persecution of the church started. And Christians were being imprisoned. And again, Paul was part of that. His extreme attitude led to him making threats towards the early church because he wanted to see the church persecuted. He wanted to see this new religion, this, this faith in Christ stop. And so he was part of persecuting the church. He wanted to imprison, hence his journey to Damascus. Hence, his journey to Damascus, because he wanted to go to Damascus, find believers, take them back to Jerusalem, and imprison them. And so, church, this was Paul. The man who, who wrote basically half of the letters in the New Testament, this was Paul. Persecuted the church, zealous for the traditions Willing to do anything to stop the spread of the message of Christ, an enemy of Christ at that time, an enemy of the gospel, and an enemy of the early believers. If there was anyone, if there was anyone that did not deserve the grace of God, it was Paul. If there's anyone that did not deserve the grace of God, it was Paul. But here at church, Church, this is where we see the beauty of the gospel. This is where we see the beauty of the gospel. That yet even the worst sinner, when God calls them unto salvation, they will fall on their knees and they will surrender their life to Christ. That even the worst sinner, when God extends grace to this person, they will surrender and they will give their life over to Jesus Christ. We hear this a lot, right? Oh, man, I'm, I've, I've gone away. I, I, I have strayed so off. I am so bad. I've done things. See, I've done things that you don't even know about. And that may be true. But when God's grace extends to this person, they will come. They will give their life over. To Jesus Christ. Why? Because the gift of salvation is in God's hands. The gift of salvation is in God's hands. John 6, says this, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last days. The words of Jesus here guarantees, promise, that those who the Father has given him, he will raise that person up on the last days. He will. Again, and we see here, Paul's life, perfect example. And that's why he shares here in verse 15. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me. Here it tells us, church, right here it tells us that Paul had nothing to do with the grace of God. Paul had nothing to do. He's sharing that even before birth, God had already called him. God has chose to extend his grace to Paul and that Paul had nothing to do with it. That when God worked and God called him, and God extended his grace to Paul on the road to, to Damascus. What did Paul do? He surrendered. Right? If we know the story, he surrendered. Yes, although we may look at this and say, well, 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 pastor, this is a message about Paul. And he's talking about his, 
his special calling or a specific calling. And yes, in a sense, but also remember, Paul is writing in this section here to defend the gospel that he received, the gospel that saves. It's a gospel calling us unto salvation. And so we see again, when God calls, people will come. And that's why Paul recognizes when he looks at his life, his boast is only in Christ alone. Only in Christ alone, the one who has called him. So who can, again, who can resist? Who can resist the grace of God? And I've just said this, right? Even the most wicked, if we look around, even the most wicked people where we will say, you know what? This person does not deserve the grace of God. But understand, salvation is not in the hands. It is in God's hand. If he chooses to extend to that person, he will. And that person's heart will be softened, and they will come, and they will surrender their life to Christ. I have a friend who is a pastor, um, and I get to see him maybe once every year, once every couple years. Um, but his former life, uh, he was a gangster. He was a gangster. Uh, but now today, he is a pastor. We see the grace of God in his life. Every time, every time uh, uh, his name is mentioned, and I want to make sure it's him, guess what I say? Uh, gangster? Right? Refer to gangster? Right? Just to make sure I'm, we're talking about the right person. But that was him. But now he is a pastor shepherding God's people. I want to note this too here. There's a thought that we control salvation. That I will come. See, I will come when I want. When I am ready, I will come to Christ. I've heard the gospel many times already. When I am ready, I will come to Christ. I'm just not ready right now. And let's just be honest, right? Maybe we have said that. Maybe we have said that before. Truth is, that's the misunderstanding of Scripture. What is taught in Scripture. Salvation doesn't start with us. Salvation starts with God. He is the one who initiated and completed salvation on our behalf. Salvation is not in our hands. And so to have that thought, to think that I will come when I want, I promise you, I guarantee you, that will never happen unless God draws you to Christ. The person who says that, they're still stuck in their sin. They still love their sin. They don't see the light. And that's why we as believers, we as church, we as parents, we as brothers and sisters, when we see a friend, a son, daughter, a sibling lost, we pray that God will open their eyes. Because it is only God who can grant them salvation. It is only God who can regenerate their dead soul. That is why we pray that God would call. And so again, Scripture doesn't teach that. Remember, Paul says here, again, right, verse 15, but when God who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, let us remember that. That it is God who does the calling. It is God who extends salvation to us. Only through his grace can we come to Jesus Christ and surrender our lives. We must recognize this. Paul recognizes. And so, moving on to point two, those who have been called unto salvation by God will live a transformed life. 
So God calls us unto salvation. That's the work of God. And he continues that work in the believer's life as he transforms our lives. The life of one who has come to Christ, that God has drawn them, they are now in Christ. Their life will be transformed by the Holy Spirit. When we come to Christ, God puts his spirit in you. His spirit is a deposit in you, church. And his spirit will work and will transform your life. That in no way, shape, or form are you the same person that you were before. There will be a definite change in those who are truly in Christ Jesus. And if we go back to the text, we look at Paul's life, a life called by God. Look what Paul says in verse 22 through 24. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. So again, right, during Paul's time, they heard, the believers heard of what Paul did. How he persecuted the church and and how determined he was. And so, to be honest, they were afraid of him. And when he converted, maybe some even were wondering, was this, like, is this conversion genuine? Or is he just trying to get into the church to persecute us, to imprison us, right? So there may even be a thought like that. But when they look at Paul's life, There was no denying. God's grace was on Paul. His life was changed. Radically different from who he was before. And so when we look at Paul's life, his testimony, church, his testimony is living proof of the power of the gospel. His testimony is living proof the power of the gospel. And this is the reason why he defends this gospel that he preached to the Galatians. This is the reason why he defends it. That when a person truly receives the gospel, their life will be changed. So church, what does this tell us? What does this tell us? This tells us that the greatest evidence or argument we can have to validate or authenticate The truth of the gospel is our own life. Greatest evidence or argument to validate or authenticate the truth of the gospel is our own life. If anyone wants to question the message that we preach as a church, if anyone wants to question it, we say this. Not in a boastful way, but humbly. Hey, look at my life. Look at my life. We must be able to point to our lives the work that God has done in us. If we say that, yes, this gospel is true. That yes, I believe in the power of the gospel. So that when people question this gospel, if it can save or not, you as a believer in Christ, you point them to Jesus by pointing them, hey, look at me. This was who I was before. But now when I came to Christ, I surrendered my life to Christ. I am a different person. Greatest argument, again, or evidence that we have is our testimony. People will know that you are a Christian, not because you tell me, not because you tell me, but again, it is through your lifestyle. It is how you live. It is how you think. It is how you carry yourself. People will know. Too many today, too many of us say that we are Christians, yet our lives look nothing like what this Bible teaches us. Our lives look nothing like this gospel. 
and no, and we wonder why the church has a bad image that that those who are non-believers cause us hypocrites, right? Because we say we believe this, but yet our lives look totally different. Non-believers, I tell you, they truly believe in what they practice, especially the Hmong people, their religion, the cultural religion. Oh, they believe it. You look at their lives, right? And I shared this um, a few weeks ago. They believe in spirits, uh, that spirits can harm them. And so what do they do? They live a life of fear. They believe it. But the church, we say that we believe in the power of the gospel, that it has changed my life, it has saved my life. That's, our lives look nothing like this Bible, this word that teaches us. And again, we wonder why the, why the outsiders calls us a bunch of hypocrites. I am a Christian, right? We say, I, I am a Christian, but yet I don't even attend church on a regular basis. I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church, or I barely go to church, maybe once every couple months. Hebrews 10, verse 25 says this, for us not to give up the meeting, not to give up meeting together, or not to forsake the gathering of the saints. We are called, we are commanded, hey, don't give up the gathering of the saints. If you are saved, you are a saint. Gather with one another. Oh, I'm a Christian, but it's hard for me to forgive. Oh, I'm a Christian, but man, like I have my clique here and I just care about them and everybody else, I don't really like other Christians. And yet we call, again, we call ourselves Christians. We are so quick to give excuses to why we do not obey the word of God. Oh, it's just who I am. It's hard for me. Oh, trust me, it's hard for me too. Because naturally, the sin inside of me wants to do as I please. But again, remember, right? The power of the gospel. Christ in you. God has given his spirit to you. That is who will give you the power to do what you need to do. According to Barner Research, 85% of young outsiders have had sufficient exposure to Christians and churches that they conclude present-day Christianity is hypocritical. It's a high statistic right there. 85% of outsiders conclude that modern-day, today, Christianity is hypocritical. They go on to say, in every In virtually every study we conduct, representing thousands of interviews every year, born-again Christians fail to display much attitudinal or behavioral evidence of transformed lives. For instance, based, and and this is a study done in in 2007, so I know it's it's, it's been a while, but I, I trust or I believe that it's probably even worse off now in terms of where our society, where our culture has gone. It says this, based on a study released in 2007, we found that most of the lifestyle activities of born-again Christians were statistically equivalent to those of non-born-again. That your lifestyle is no different. That's what the studies show. Again, that's why the outsiders call us hypocrites, right? Probably difference between majority of believers and non-believers is that guys on Sunday you guys come to church and they don't because during the week we must examine ourselves do we look different not on the outside but in terms of how we conduct ourselves throughout the week So if basically, according to the study, if you put 20 people in a room, 10 were Christians, 10 were not Christians, and you walked in there, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Disheartening, right, church? 
very disheartening. Non-believers, they party, they drink, we party, we drink. They cohabitate, we justify, we cohabitate. They engage in sexual activities before marriage or outside of marriage, and we do the same. The divorce rate within the Christian community is almost as high as the non-Christian community. How can that be when Paul, the word of God is saying, look, when God has called us into salvation, there's a transformation that takes place in your life. So how can how can this, the stats be so similar, church? We have to think about that. And we wonder why, adding on to that, our witness to the community or to our friends or family who are non-believers are so ineffective. You wonder why they're like, yes, I've heard this a thousand times from you, but I am looking straight at your life, and there's nothing different about you. There's nothing different about you. And we wonder why it's, we, our witness is so in, ineffective, and it's so hard for us to bring in new believers. They're looking at us, church. And Paul is telling us here that when we come to Christ, there's a transformation that takes place. It's not, it might take place. No, 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 no. It will take place. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. God literally dwells in you. Yet there are some who will argue this point. They say, hey, pastor, but, but Jesus sat with the sinners. We read that in the gospel. He sat with the sinners. And I will say, yes, you are correct. But never did he engage in the activities of these sinners. Jesus never engaged. And so if that's the argument you want to bring, well, it falls short already. Truth is, that only validates that we are called to be more like Jesus in every situation. To live like Jesus so that when people see us in, in whatever situation that we are in, that people see Christ. That yes, we are to um, be around sinners, but we are never to engage because we want them to see Christ in us. We want them to receive the truth that we have. I have, uh, I remember my first year in college in 2001. Oh, that's a long time ago. We, we met, uh, I met a friend. Um, and boy, that year he was, uh, man, just super rebellious. Uh, how he talked, his attitude, man, you could, I mean, you're just like, man, are you, are you, are you serious? Like, we're, at, we're in a Christian campus here, okay? And he Whatever he wanted to do, he would just do. And unfortunately, uh, after I think either a semester or a year, he got kicked out. He got kicked out of uh, Crown. About a year after, he came back. And you can see the change in his life. His attitude, how he talked. Man, he went from uh, yappy yappy to... Super soft. I'm like, who is this person? That literally just two years ago, attitude, I'll do whatever I want. I don't care about the, the, the um, administration here. I'll do whatever I want. To now, humble, soft-spoken, different attitude. Praise God. Because it was his work in his life. John 14, 15 says this, if you love me, you will obey what I command, Jesus says. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command. This passage calls the believer unto obedience. Those who have been redeemed, it's a calling for us to obey. A called life, church, is a transformed life. There's no way around it. Called life is a transformed life. 
For this reason, Paul ends the chapter with this, verse 24. And they praise God because of me. They praise God because of me. The reversal of Paul's life, when word got out that now Paul was being persecuted for preaching the gospel he tried to destroy, when word was out that now he was being persecuted, right, church? There was no doubt in their minds now, wow, again, the grace of God is on this person's life. This person is saved. And when the churches, the believers in Judea heard this, they praised God for the work that God did in Paul's life. A life that is transformed church, one that is aligned with the word of God. Believers will praise God. When I see, when members of the church see that this is who you once were and now you are this, we point to God and say, glory to God. Because I knew you, who you were before, and now look at you now. That is only the work of God that that can happen. And so I have to ask us, when people look at your life, church, close friends, co-workers, other church members who you may have grown up with, when people look at your life, do they praise God, especially your believing friends, family members, do they praise God for the work that God has done and the work that God continues to do in your life? Changing you, molding you, shaping you into the image of Christ. Do they praise God? Or is it when they look at your life, they look at how you talk, your attitude, how you think, that even though you may profess to be a Christian, they see no change. That you are still the same person you were 5, 10, 15 years ago. Because again, I want us to draw to this point that Paul is saying, that when God calls us unto salvation, transformation takes place in that person's life. And when transformation takes place, we praise God for that work. We must examine ourselves, church. If people, if, if the church is not praising God, not giving thanks to God for the work that he has done in your life, we must examine ourselves. I'm not calling you, church, unto perfection. None of us are perfect. That is the reason why we need Christ in our lives. He has done everything perfectly for us. That's why we stand righteous before a holy God. But what I am saying is that believers called are striving for holiness that's a fact striving for a life that brings glory to God and so let me conclude with this if you are saved praise God I praise God if you are saved If you have Christ in your life, praise God. Because we see here in God's word throughout scripture that it is only by the grace of God that you are saved. A grace that you and I did not deserve. And so I praise God that if you are in Christ, praise be to our Father who is gracious, who has called us and set us apart Because we understand that if God did not call us and that we are not saved, we would still be dead in our sins today. That if we are not saved, we are still dead in our sins today. But since we are, since God has called us, redeem us in Christ. Church, let us live a life that will show evidence of that transformation. Evidence of the salvation that God is giving to us. Let us strive for holiness, church. Let us